Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Katie Stubbs, and I lead the public engagement team here at Alzheimer's Research UK. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the sixth event in our Lab Notes online series. Today, we're hearing about research into dementia with Lewy bodies, with two speakers and then time for questions at the end. This event is being recorded and will be added to our website and YouTube channel sometime next week. If you've missed previous events, you can watch any of them back in your own time. If you'd like to use subtitles during this event, you can turn them on using the CC button at the bottom of your Zoom window. While there may be a few mistakes as they're generated live, we'll edit these so that they are accurate on the recording. So before we get going, we've just got a couple of poll questions for you. So these will just pop up on your screen now. And they just ask you about your reasons for attending today to rate your current knowledge about dementia and whether you've attended one of our Lab Notes events before. So those should have just popped up now and I'll just pause for a moment to let you answer them. And it's just useful, these questions just help us to understand a bit more about you and why you've come along today and uh, help to tailor these events in future. So I think if we could get the answers up now, then we can see um, who we've got coming along today. There we go. So people rating their knowledge of dementia about average um, and a lot of people coming because they have a friend or family member with dementia or their work is related to dementia. Those seem to be the most common ones. And we've got a mix, I think about uh, uh, two thirds of people attending today have come before, but some people um, are attending for the first time. So it's wonderful to have you. Thank you so much for joining us um, at this Lab Notes event. So the plan for today is first some quick updates from me before you'll then hear two talks. Um, let me just share my screen. I've got some slides to show. There we go. Um, uh, here from two talks, one from Professor Alan Thomas and the other from Dr. Jan Daniel Erskine. We'll then move to the Q&A session and we'll try to answer as many questions as possible in the time that we have. Many of you have submitted questions in advance when you registered and you can also ask questions during the event. To submit a question, click the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, which will bring up the Q&A box where you can type your question in. So first, I'm just going to briefly share a few updates from us here at Alzheimer's Research UK. And as the poll showed, we know we have a mix of regulars and first time attendees today. So just want to briefly introduce who we are. So at Alzheimer's Research UK, our vision is a world free from the fear, harm and heartbreak of dementia. And to deliver this vision, we fund biomedical research, supporting scientists working to build our understanding of the biology of the diseases that cause dementia. And this research is helping to find new and improved ways to reduce risk, make earlier and more accurate diagnoses and to create effective dementia treatments. And there are lots of different ways people support our work. And one that is happening right this month is something called 5K May. So you may remember last year during lockdown, an organization called Run for Heroes helped to raise over seven million pounds for NHS charities together. And this year they wanted to support many other charities who have felt the impact of the pandemic, including us at Alzheimer's Research UK. So they're encouraging as many people as possible to take part in 5K May. And it's relatively simple. You can walk, cycle, swim, run, or move in whatever way you like, just covering five kilometers. You then donate five pounds to a charity of your choice and nominate five other people to do the same. You can encourage more people to take part by taking pictures and posting them on social media and helping to spread that message. Just two weeks into May, we've already had lots of people take part. And if you're interested in finding out more, do check out the website, which we're also putting in the chat as a link. In other news from this month, um, last week saw an auction take place of items from the private collection of the actor David Prowse, who had Alzheimer's and sadly passed away in November last year. David was known for playing Darth Vader in the original Star Wars trilogy and was also known by many as the Green Cross Code Man, the face of road safety in Britain. The auction took place on May the 4th, which is known around the world as Star Wars Day due to the iconic line, May the Force be with you. 
Included in the items up for auction were scripts from the Empire Strikes Back, mementos and messages from his co-stars, a Vader mask, and also his superhero suit. Together, the auction raised an amazing £400,000, and David's family are donating a percentage of this to Alzheimer's Research UK to support our vital research into Alzheimer's and other forms of dementia. So those are just a few examples of some of the varied and different ways in which people can support our pioneering research. And it's thanks to support like this that we've been able to reopen some of our funding schemes this month. So last year at the start of the pandemic, we took the tough decision to pause awarding new funding and focus on supporting our existing commitments. It's been a challenging year and we've still got a way to go as we recover, but it's really good news to be open for research applications again. And we've listened to the research community about where that funding is needed most and have opened our fellowship schemes that support young researchers. These scientists have been at risk of leaving dementia research, as many are on shorter contracts and don't have secure permanent roles. Fellowship funding gives them the chance to develop their independence in research, and it's really wonderful to have one of our current fellows speaking today, Dr. Daniel Erskine. So this Lab Notes event and others in our series are brought to you by us along with our research network. We provide funding to our research network to support small projects and pieces of equipment, support scientists in networking and collaborating with each other. Before the pandemic, each centre would organise an annual event to share their work with people in the local area. And so we work with them to bring these events online. So at this event today, you'll hear from two scientists in our North Research Network working at Newcastle University. Professor Alan Thomas is an old age psychiatrist and Dr. Daniel Erskine is an Alzheimer's Research UK research fellow and they'll each speak about their different areas of work studying dementia with Lewy bodies. After they've spoken, I'll return to the screen and we'll have the Q&A session. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Alan Thomas and hand over to him for his talk. There we go. Welcome Alan and over to you. Good afternoon everyone from a sunny Newcastle and uh, I'm going to talk to you for a few minutes then about an uh, area of research I've been particularly interested in recently of clinical research. I hope you can see these slides clearly and hear me clearly today. So prodromal dementia with Lewy bodies. You may not have heard of this but the concept is one that we uh, deal with more and more frequently as we see people with dementia. We see them ahead of the time they actually meet the full criteria for dementia. And I'd like to begin by giving an example from a patient who was referred recently to me and seen by my current excellent registrar. And uh, Mrs G's complaint was not about her memory or any other aspect of her cognition. It was rather about people coming into her house. And so she was referred with something that sounded like she had a psychotic illness. She complained that these people would come into her room. They would sit in the chairs in her living room. They wouldn't talk to her but neither would they leave. And she found this, I suppose understandably, very annoying. These intruders, uh, perhaps different intruders, would also come into her bedroom at night. Uh, she thought they might be coming from the local pub and they would uh, sleep then on her bedroom floor, again, not communicate with her. And you can understand that she got very distressed by these experiences. She also reported regularly seeing cats running around on the floor and sometimes also children climbing through the window into her bedroom. She, as I say, was very annoyed that these people wouldn't leave. And her son, because of her increasing distress, had moved to live with her to try and support her. And she was angry with him when he would say that he couldn't see these people and these cats and so on. And this led to some altercations. And a particular problem was when these people would come in the middle of the night, you'd want to leave the house to get away from them. And, and her son had difficulty sometimes preventing this, even in the middle of the night. His son said that it's like she's in a dream, just seeing these things I can't see and, 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 and shouting at the people I can't see. So she had then these experiences of florid visual, florid visual hallucinations, complex, real looking people, as you can see, it looked like you and me, very real to her, but not obviously visible to anybody else. 
but on assessment it was also clear that she had some features of Parkinsonism. Her gait was shuffling rather than a full swing with her arms and legs and she showed some slowness, what we call bradykinesia, slowness with her movements. She had increased tone in her arms and her son reported that when she tried to write she wrote much in, with using much smaller writing than she used to do. It was also noted that she seemed to have what we call problems with her, her seeing space, visuospatial problems. She was often bumping into furniture. Her son, who had had to take to staying in her bedroom with her at night, uh, said that she, she was surprisingly active when she was asleep, moving around. And then he remembered how his father, who had now died by this point, but her husband had said to him that uh, she used to kick him a lot in the sleep and she'd shout out a lot nowadays in her sleep. And he had then taken to sleeping in another bed and in another room in the house. And these features then are what we recognise as features of what we call REM sleep behaviour disorder, another characteristic feature of Lewy body disease. And her son also reported she was so very changeable. Sometimes she could be quite coherent and have a good memory and be reasonably normal, but at other times very impaired. And these changes in alertness then were observed by my registrar during the interview. And her son also said that often she felt very sleeping sometimes we just fall asleep uh, during the day and all these then led to some difficulties of course in her carrying on her normal life at home. So she then is somebody who does not meet criteria for dementia which I'll come to in a minute uh, but on testing she did show some evidence of deficits in her memory and other aspects of the cognition, along with though these much more prominent features that I've described to you, characteristic of Lewy body disease. So prodromal Lewy body disease or prodromal DLB is what we're talking about here. And so before then we know somebody gets a full dementia illness over here, as it were on this diagram, before people get a full dementia, then there are many, many years over which the pathology develops in the brain. So my colleague, Dr. Erskine, will be talking a little later about synuclein pathology. And that synuclein deposition begins maybe 20 years before the clinical features I've just been describing, and then the dementia emerges. And this Lewy pathology then, the deposition of the synuclein in the nerve cells in the brain and elsewhere, gradually comes over over many years. And this is the pre clinical phase. At this point, there are no clinical features at all to recognise that this is happening. But eventually then the green graph is that these symptoms gradually emerge uh, as then cell damage increases. And so these first symptoms ahead then, prodromal before the onset of the dementia, these earliest features then are what we're talking about today. So just to remind you then, dementia then means that somebody has memory problems and problems with other aspects of their cognition, that is with the way they think, see things in space, perceive objects out there, uh, with their language function, with their thinking and planning, with their concentration, different aspects we assess. They have impairments and these impairments are severe enough to mean that these people with dementia then, as you'll know many of you, can no longer function independently. They need help. There's a decline with a decline in their cognition. They no longer function independently. And this isn't explained by other phenomena, particularly a delirium, an acute illness that leads to an impairment in their uh, memory, cognition and, and function. So it's this combination of cognitive impairments with an inability to function independently. So you need the person with dementia, you need somebody there to help them all the time. Before though people get dementia and, be, and need that help, they have what we call a mild cognitive impairment. So as the cognition gets worse and it's no longer normal, and we can show with testing, like with Mrs. G, that there are these problems there in memory and so on. They're there, the problems, but they don't lead to such difficulties that the person can't function on their own. So without help, somebody like Mrs. G could function on her own. Now in her case, the problem was of course, prominently her psychosis, her complex hallucinations and so on. 
but in Alzheimer's disease and other dementias, the cognition comes on, is impaired, but people can function independently, don't need somebody with them to help them. It's not yet at the level of dementia. Now, when we diagnose dementia or MCI, mild cognitive impairment, each of these are clinical syndromes that we sort of regard as umbrella syndromes because under the umbrella, then we have several different causes, quite a lot of potential causes. The most common ones then being Alzheimer's disease, of course, Lewy body disease that we're talking about today, frontotemporal lobe degeneration syndromes, vascular, uh, damage the brain. And these then, these different diseases cause mild cognitive impairment and cause when the uh, cognition gets worse, cause dementia. So after we diagnose dementia or mild cognitive impairment, we're interested in diagnosing the cause. We want to say, well, why is this person ill in this way? Now, generally, we'll be told, you'll be told that most people who have dementia or mild cognitive impairment, it's due to Alzheimer's disease and or vascular disease of the brain, over three quarters of the cases are typically said to be due to these. But this is really a, a bit out of date. We know from a lot of work in brain banks, including here, this just published from the Brains for Dementia Research Programme, that that's not really true anymore. So many of you will know of our BDR programme, you may be involved in this, and we just published this major paper showing that in fact over three quarters of people with mild cognitive impairment and dementia, the cause is Alzheimer's disease and with or without Lewy body disease. As you can see here, most people it's Alzheimer's disease and Lewy body disease. Frontotemporal uh, diseases are also quite common. And that's often not recognised too in older people because the people in our programme had a mean age of 83. And vascular disease is much less common than is usually said to be the case. So then the focus here is on these people who have not yet got dementia, but do have Lewy body disease causing their problems, which are not just memory problems. So as with Mrs G, then her illness did not begin to show itself, a disease did not begin to show itself with uh, cognitive problems, it began with these hallucinations and these fluctuations. And so we have different ways in which people lead into finally getting a dementia. So they might get a mild cognitive impairment, but as with Mrs G, it can be due to other, other features of prominence. We recognise also in the research criteria that we just published this year, then what we call a delirium onset, where people, the main uh, prominent symptom at onset is a marked confusional state. We recognise people a little like Mrs G, or what we call a psychiatric onset, where psychosis or depression or anxiety is very prominent. But when you look carefully in these people, you'll often find that they have cognitive problems as well. And the major road into getting dementia with Lewy bodies then is through mild cognitive impairment or mild cognitive impairment then in these criteria with Lewy bodies. And so these are criteria we, we are learning to use to make this diagnosis. And so you'll notice then these core clinical features. Two of these are sufficient for the diagnosis, but Mrs. G had all four of these features initially. And so we didn't proceed to do any special imaging because the diagnosis was uh, confidently made without the need for these special biomarkers, which I'm not going to say anything about today. Because now I want to tell you about somebody else who had prodromal dementia with Lewy bodies before his illness deteriorated into dementia with Lewy bodies, and he died from this. Someone then, of course, much more well known, uh, a famous individual whom you will, most of you will recognise, who died with DLB several years ago. And Robin Williams, then the Oscar winning actress, um, his wife, Susan Schneider Williams, wrote an article in the major journal Neurology called The Terrorist Inside My Husband's Brain. I encourage you to read that. Google that, The Terrorist Inside My Husband's Brain, and you'll find the article. You can download it for free. I think it's very readable. It's lucid. It's moving account of her experience of her husband's illness. And so in this article, she describes how when he was making films and when he was on Broadway, then 
he was forgetting his lines because he was developing these cognitive problems. And he was later diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. But before any of these happens, he had other features that we see in people with Lewy body disease. He had what we call autonomic symptoms, problems uh, with controlling his bladder, problems with his sleep, problems with his bowels. He also had some psychosis like Mrs. G and he had prominent mood symptoms like I talked about that psychiatric onset. He had marked anxiety and depression which caused much distress to him and, and, and to his wife Susan. But also it was soon apparent that he had these cognitive fluctuations and, and Susan Williams describes these very helpfully saying that these symptoms then uh, they appear and disappear at random times, even throughout the course of the day. I experienced my brilliant husband being lucid with clear reasoning one minute and then five minutes later blank and lost in confusion, like you may remember with Mrs. G. Uh, she also described how he would thrash around at night with terrible sleep that we see in so many people with Lewy body disease. And he too, then it would appear had REM sleep behavior disorder. He also had problems with judging distances and with his vision. So he'd visual spatial difficulties and he may have had complex visual hallucinations or they weren't clearly reported in the way that I showed you with Mrs. G distressed by those intruders and the children and so on. And on examination, he was then, as I say, diagnosed with Parkinson's. She described him having this a face, this mask-like face, which characteristic. He had the tremor. He too had the slow shuffling gait that we see in people with this illness. So he had these features of a slowness, bradykinesia, a stiffness like Mrs. G, and tremor, which Mrs. G didn't have. And so just to finish off then, this is some good news really about Mrs. G and to show that these features that we've seen in prodromal dementia with Lewy bodies are very treatable. Uh, she was started, we started her quickly on Dinepazil, which we use for Alzheimer's disease as well as Lewy body disease and clonazepam, a sleeping tablet that we use for REM sleep behavior disorder. And after just a couple of weeks, she was sleeping well to the great relief of her and her son. And the hallucinations had largely disappeared. And certainly there was none of that distress and trying to leave the house. And a few weeks later, she's further improved. Uh, she hasn't had any side effects. And so we will be increasing the dose. We, we did increase the dose and we expect to see further improvement with Mrs. G. So thanks very much for listening to me. And I'm now going to hand over to my colleague, as I say, at Newcastle, Dr. Daniel Erskine, who's going to tell you about alpha synuclein and the pathology I've been telling you about and the work he's been doing in the labs. Thank you, Dan. Thanks very much, Alan. And um, ah, what's happening here? Two seconds. Always have a technical hitch. Um, there we are. My apologies, I had it at the end of the slideshow. Yeah, so my name's uh, Daniel Erskine, um, and I'm going to talk a little bit today about um, some things that Alan's touched upon, which is Lewy bodies, um, these uh, protein accumulations that occur in the brain. And um, I'm just going to start by explaining a little bit about what these are, and um, hopefully you will find this work uh, interesting. So, as I said, so as I mentioned at first, uh, Lewy bodies are accumulations of a protein called alpha synuclein. Despite finding out about these in the 1920s, we still do not know why they form or what they are even doing. But they are very strongly associated with a group of diseases that we call the Lewy body diseases, of which dementia with Lewy bodies is. And the common view in the field is that Lewy bodies accumulate within uh, neurons, uh, brain cells and ultimately overwhelm, um, cause, overwhelm them, cause dysfunction, and ultimately kill them. And the loss of brain cells that carry out particular functions is thought to underlie the symptoms that are experienced by patients. And a really good example of this is a part of the brain that I'm going to show in this bottom right panel um, in A. Um, so this is the substantia nigra, which is Latin for black substance, because these neurons, uh, brain cells, are, are black in color. And we know that they form Lewy bodies within these structures and that these brain cells ultimately die. We also know that these brain cells produce a chemical in the brain called dopamine. And the loss of this chemical as a result of the death of these brain cells 
is thought to lead to the Parkinsonian movement features that Professor Thomas has just mentioned. So this stiffness of movement and tremor. Um, but I don't think it's just as straightforward as this. And as a really, really basic measure of what we're talking about, whenever a person who's had dementia with Lewy bodies comes to postmortem, so most of my, my research occurs using postmortem brain tissue, there are Lewy bodies everywhere in the brain. They are distributed completely throughout the brain. So one would assume that if Lewy bodies were always killing brain cells, that we would have a marked loss of the weight of the brain because so much of it has died. And certainly that is what we see in Alzheimer's disease. But when we look at people with dementia with Lewy bodies, we don't find a significant loss of brain weight. And in fact, it's actually much more similar to what we call control cases or elderly people who don't have dementia. And why I think this is significant is because brain cell loss in dementia with Lewy bodies doesn't seem to be nearly as widespread as it is in Alzheimer's disease. This is really important because obviously if there is less damage to the brain, there is the potential that we can fix it. And I'm gonna mention some of the regions that do have a loss of brain cells, where we think brain cells are dying. And I've listed them here. I'm not gonna go through these sort of old fashioned Latin name structures, but what I will say is the thing that strikes me as very interesting about these brain regions is that they are very active areas of the brain. These are regions of the brain that contain brain cells that are always doing something. And that's really interesting to me because we know from many studies over many years in neuroscience that brain cells that are very active require very high levels of energy to perform their functions. And this is significant because it has long been thought that dementia with Lewy bodies and other Lewy body diseases like Parkinson's disease may involve difficulty of, may be related to difficulty of brain cells producing energy. And in fact, these brain regions listed here that we know have brain cells that die in Lewy body disease are precisely the brain regions we would expect to die if there was a problem with the brain uh, producing energy. But just before we go any further, I wanna talk a little bit about how the brain functions under normal conditions. So the brain produces a lot of electrical activity. So what happens is that the brain cells in our brain fire electrical signals at each other. And this is how our brain, different parts of our brain communicate with each other. And if anyone has ever had an EEG examination where they've had this skull cap fitted, this detects this electrical activity. And this electrical activity is actually lots of brain cells firing at exactly the same time. And it needs to be lots of brain cells at the same time to be able to be detected on the outside of the scalp with these electrodes. So a very key question for me and, and for research in general is how these brain cells all fire at exactly the same time. And to really get to the bottom of that, I have to explain a little bit about two different types of brain cells in the brain. So we have pyramidal neurons, which are shown here in green and so-called because they look a little bit like pyramids. And these, I want you to think of as the orchestra. Each of these pyramidal neurons is producing something. In an orchestra, it's sound. In terms of the brain, it's electrical activity. Now, we all know that an orchestra, if everyone was playing their own instrument, it would just make no sense. The music wouldn't flow. It wouldn't all be combined together. So as we all know, an orchestra needs a conductor. And the conductor keeps everyone playing at the same time and everyone working in synchrony. And that's what precisely what interneurons do. I've shown them here in red. So interneurons are the conductors of the orchestra. They make sure that the, the pyramidal neurons are firing at the same time. And this is an absolutely necessary process for our brains to perform our highest functions, things such as attention and memory. And these are all processes that we know are very vulnerable in most types of dementia, but particularly in Lewy body dementia. But I think interneurons are really interesting for a few reasons. The first is that I suspect that a lot of the symptoms that we observe in Lewy body dementia can be attributed to interneurons. So in his previous presentation, Professor Thomas mentioned these differences that occur in one person over time, these transient clinical features where a person may seem normal one moment and may then go to a period where they are very confused um, and also visual hallucinations. Sometimes they are present, most of the time they are not. And these symptoms are actually very consistent with what we would expect if interneurons were damaged, if interneurons weren't working properly, and each part of the orchestra was playing its own thing at its own time. 
because these are also symptoms that we see in some other diseases, such as epilepsy, especially epilepsy that isn't characterized by big motor seizures. Um, but also significantly, interneurons also are very active brain cells. They're brain cells that are constantly doing something. And we know that if energy supply to the brain, which I previously mentioned is something we think that happens in Lewy body dementia, it would be expected to affect interneurons. But here's the big catch. Interneurons do not get Lewy bodies. In fact, they never develop Lewy bodies. Lewy bodies only develop, it would seem, in pyramidal neurons. So this is nonetheless a really important question because this may be a potentially new avenue that hasn't been explored because these cells don't develop Lewy bodies. So one of the first things that I did was use post-mortem brain tissue from people with Lewy body dementia. We are so lucky at Newcastle to have this amazing resource, Newcastle Brain Tissue Resource, where you know, quite amazing people very generously donate their brain tissue after they've died, knowing that it will never have helped them, obviously, because, because they've passed on, but in the hope that it will help other people with these diseases. Because I can assure you as a scientist that there is no substitute whatsoever for looking at the real brains of people affected by dementia, because ultimately they are the experts. And there is no model or anything similar that can ever replicate the importance of looking at human brain tissue, in my opinion. So what we did was we counted into neurons and we counted pyramidal neurons in a part of the brain called the prefrontal cortex, which is quite important for attention. And we did that because attention is something that we know is affected in the body dementia. But what we found um, was that actually there was a reduction in the number of interneurons. And that's really interesting because as I said, these are neurons that do not contain Lewy bodies, but that do have high energy um, demands. And that also, uh, as I said, seem to be related to uh, symptoms of, of Lewy body dementia. What was also really interesting is that we've seen a relationship between the loss of these interneurons and the severity of some of the symptoms um, that the people had reported when they were alive. So things such as cognitive fluctuations, these changes in awareness and attention over time. So we looked a little bit further and we decided to explore our idea that maybe the brain has difficulty producing energy. Um, so we looked at, at individual brain cells from these people. And these are actually interneurons here that you can, you can see. And what we found is that, that a part of the brain, uh, a part of, of every cell in the body, um, apart from some maybe the red blood cells, um, known as the mitochondrion, which is a thing that produces energy uh, for cells to, to sustain their functions, was actually quite badly damaged in these cells. And this didn't really come as a huge surprise to us, as I said, because there, there was some literature on this already. There was some suggestion that these may be damaged. What was more surprising is we found it in other cells as well. So this made us then think that maybe the brain in people with, with Lewy body dementia has a general problem with producing energy and that it affects these cells most because these cells require energy most. So we decided to test this uh, and, and for this, we had to use, obviously we can't use post-mortem brain tissue for this because obviously it's no longer active because the person has died. So instead we used the brains of mice. Uh, and what we found was that if we damage the energy supply to uh, the brain cells with a chemical, and this is preliminary data, we've only, we've only looked at this in a few animals, but there's, there's many suggestions that, that this will occur anyway, we found a loss of a brain wave that's associated with interneurons. So we found that that the interneurons uh, brain wave is eliminated pretty much completely by damaging the energy supply to the brain. So this is really important. And I think this is a really interesting finding because it suggests absolutely that despite not having Lewy bodies, this particular type of cell uh, may well be contributing to the symptoms of Lewy body dementia. But a major problem with this is that we're looking at this in mice. Mice never get dementia. So for us to produce dementia in a mouse, we essentially have to know what causes dementia so we can replicate it in the mouse. And that's really difficult. Uh, and we're talking about symptoms and a disease that never occurs in mice. So it's very difficult to sometimes take the findings from mice and happily apply them to humans. So it's for that reason that we're developing, I think something really exciting. And I, I hasten to add that this is not something that I'm developing on my own. This is, this is very much a team effort with, with some of my colleagues at Newcastle. And I think it's the only 
um, example of this system that's actually used in the world, but I might be wrong because um, because I, obviously I don't know what everyone's doing. But what we're doing is we are taking brain tissue with permission, of course, from people who are undergoing neurosurgical procedures. So these are people who may have a brain tumor or they may have temporal lobe epilepsy, where the surgeons have to cut through brain tissue to get to the tumor. So the normal, as in the non-tumor tissue that they give, they give to us. And we can keep this alive in the laboratory for as much as three weeks. And this is something that's very much in development, but it's something that really excites me and my colleagues who are working on it for the reason that this is the first time we may have a chance to actually start exploring dementia using real human brain tissue. Not just a couple of cells grown in a lab, but an actual intact piece of human brain. And this is tremendous potential, I think, for understanding what causes dementia. And that's something we're actively looking at at the moment, but also potentially trialing new treatments. It's an open, um, it's something we don't really talk about in dementia, but a lot of drugs that, that seem to show a lot of promise in mice don't ever seem to be effective in humans. And this is a major problem. And the hope is, and certainly the hope that we all have, is that by producing more human-like models of dementia, such as this, that we may be able to develop more effective drugs that actually will work whenever they're tried in people with these conditions. And I'm just gonna finish here by showing a picture. This is um, some brain cells um, that we have we've labeled with a, with a green dye um, from our unique um, human brain tissue that we've kept alive in the lab. And I really hope that at some stage in the future, I will be able to come and talk to you and, and give an update on what I hope to be exciting process, progress with this particular, um, with this particular uh, system. So with, there, uh, with that, I will just stop. I'm gonna hand back to Katie, and I think we will then be moving towards a question and answer session. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Daniel, and also to Alan. Those talks were absolutely fantastic. We've had lots of questions, so I'll just wait for Alan to come back on screen and we will start, we've got lots of time for questions. So do keep submitting them in the Q&A box. So I think I'm gonna go with a clinical question first. That's gonna to come to you, Alan. Um, and it's a question around how long can it take to make a diagnosis of dementia with Lewy bodies? So what happens along the way uh, and how long can that take? Uh, the answer is really too long. Um, Sadly, we've shown in work done here in Newcastle that it takes a lot longer to make a diagnosis of dementia with Lewy bodies than other dementias, particularly Alzheimer's disease. So in our study, which we published last year, it was about six months to diagnosis of Alzheimer's and over a year to diagnosis of DLB. Um, and that was both here and in uh, this, an area south in the country around Cambridge, East Anglia area. So, you know, the reason for the work we were doing was to try to help um, people around the country, memory services, recognise and diagnose more quickly. Wonderful, thank you. And then uh, one of the questions we've had come through live today is, uh, how many years is someone likely to live after they've been diagnosed? And I, I'm guessing this is with dementia with Lewy bodies. Yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a piece of string question, unfortunately, isn't it? Because it depends when you're diagnosed. So some people like Mrs. G, who might present, you know, diagnosed very, very early. And it may be a few years before she gets dementia at all. Um, we do know that once somebody has dementia, then they do decline more quickly with dementia, with Lewy bodies and with Alzheimer's disease. Uh, so it may be four or five years on average before people die with DLB, but um, that's from dementia onset, not when it's first diagnosed in something like Mrs. G. And it's very variable as well. That's, the, that's why I don't really like answering this kind of question to a patient. Yeah, I think it's, it's one of the big challenges with this type of dementia, but with all types of dementia is trying to understand why some people progress at different rates and, and give people an accurate picture is something that I know your research is really keen to answer that question. Um, so another question that we've had, and I think you, you've touched on it a bit, both of you with, uh, with your talks, but um, we've had questions around some of the symptoms that people can experience um, in dementia with Lewy bodies and this kind of the, the fluctuation that can occur. So I wonder if there's any more, I guess, detail that you might be able to add around why 
somebody with dementia low bodies might have really severe symptoms and then fluctuate to feel to being a bit better do we, do we know why that is or is it there's still quite a lot unknown in that area do you want to take that down i think it's nearer to your work than mine yeah i mean i'm really happy to so I think most of this probably, and I, I would like to just add that this is my opinion and may not necessarily be shared by everyone. A lot of people in, in our in this particular research field have strong opinions, but my opinion generally would be that it, it probably reflects differences in how the brain produces um, activity. So going back to something of what I was saying, um, I'm always a bit loath to make too many comparisons to the epilepsy because I don't think it's exactly the same. But I think that there are similarities in that there are is perhaps uncontrollable activity in the brain. So that occurs with seizures um, and a seizure doesn't have to be a whole body experience. You know, you can get things like um, non-convulsive status epilepticus where you get potentially, you know, prolonged periods of, of inattentiveness. For example, you can get temporal lobe epilepsy, which is often characterized by visual hallucinations. And I think it's maybe a little bit like the conductor's been taken out of the orchestra, that there is uh, that everyone starts, that the brain cells all start doing their own thing. And then this is quickly brought under control because the, the, the brain has sort of a feel safe mechanism to bring it on itself under control if this happens. And I think it may be changes that occur over time where the brain goes out of control and then it's reined in and that this continues to happen. And that, that's a possibility. But what I will say is it's something we're actively investigating. And maybe if I'm speaking again at this in a few years, it's something we'll have a more robust answer for. Wonderful. Yeah. We're really keen to kind of hear the progress that happens in that research. Um, so a question about hallucinations. I'm just going to read it. It's come through live. So Julie has asked, does a person hallucinate about members of their family, especially members who have died and also not recognize other members of the family who are living? So I guess it's about the nature of some of these hallucinations. I wonder, Alan, in your time, is it quite varied or are there similar patterns that we see and what people are hallucinating about? One of the surprising things in my experience is that they use, people don't usually know, recognise the people they hallucinate. Um, so I'm sure it does happen, but it's certainly not typical. Um, and the do they recognise other people is a bit different. I mean, I've mentioned that the visuospatial problems people have mean they do have difficulty often recognising. Um, that occurs in all dementias quite often later on when, when the dementia is more severe, people fail to recognise family members. That's typically, of course, memory driven, whereas in Lewy body disease, it's earlier and it's probably related to what I'm saying about the difficulty in seeing uh, shapes and uh, perceiving objects and people correctly. Yeah, so yeah, quite varied then. Um, We've got a question about is dementia with Lewy bodies hereditary and if so are there any tests available? Um, yeah so I mean I'm happy to take this one. I think that um, an important distinction is hereditary and genetic firstly. Um, so often when people say is a condition hereditary that, or, or when they say is a condition genetic they mean hereditary. Um, so a hereditary condition is something that's inherited. A genetic condition is something that relates to something that's occurred with uh, the genes, the, the instructions for making what's in all of our cells. So there is some evidence that, um, that some genetic factors may contribute to DLB. But I hasten to add that these are not like Huntington's disease, for example, where it's an on-off, you know, you either have it or you don't have it. It's much more that there are small changes um, that give a slightly increased risk um, and that sometimes if someone has a lot of these risk factors, they may have a greater risk because they have so many of them added together. Um, so with regard to, is there a test available? Um, it may be the case that there will be someday, but I don't think it is likely that, that that would be available in the near future because the other thing is we still don't understand the genetic risk well. There's a couple of genes that have quite, uh, I mean, a still small, but, but bigger uh, risk. Um, but there's probably lots of others. And that's actually why we need research, particularly in this area, um, as some of these may be modifiable. So they may relate to, to diet or lifestyle factors um, and interact with them. Yeah, I think it's really important to kind of, uh, to explain how just having a risk gene doesn't mean that you're definitely going to get it. So actually it's 
the information that we can give about what that means and we don't have enough of those answers yet so that's a re really good answer to hear um we've had another question so i think alan this might end up being one for you what's the main difference between parkinson's dementia to dementia with lewy bodies is it just the name or is actually there's something else that's different between those two so the, the difference is really in how people first come to medical attention, that is the first symptom somebody has. So if somebody ends up with a Parkinson's disease dementia at that point, they will have begun their illness with Parkinson's disease itself, often had that for many years, and then they later, very late perhaps in their illness, develop dementia. With dementia with Lewy bodies, they come first to medical attention because of problems with their memory and their cognition and so on. And they may or may not have Parkinson's at that point. Most will eventually develop Parkinson's, about 80% will develop Parkinson's eventually with DLB, but it isn't necessarily the case. So it's really clinically two different presentations uh, of the same disease, because what they have in common is they both have the same synuclein pathology and damage to neurons that, that Daniel's been talking about. Uh, so the shared pathology, but affecting different parts of the brain at different times, leading to different clinical presentations. Yes, thank you. And um, we've had um, a few question, a question about one of the case studies that you presented, Alan. So Vicky's asking, really interested in the improvement in Mrs. G with the Nezapil for hallucinations. Can you tell me more about this? Um, her hallucinations presented in her father much later than other symptoms and Nezapil didn't have uh, any effect in that case. Uh, guessing just another example of how difficult it is with variations between patients. So yeah, Denezapil for, for hallucinations, does it work for everyone or is it quite a mixed bag? So, I mean, the reason we expect it to work is because of work done in the brain bank where Dan's been doing his work because brain tissue work done some years ago here showed that people with hallucinations and Lewy body disease have a uh, much greater loss of the cholinergic neurons. And so it fits with that, that when you use a treatment like denepazil that boosts the levels of acetylcholine, that you would get a good response. And, and usually we do see a very good response if, as with Mrs. G um, and very marked improvement, usually getting rid of the hallucinations completely, not necessarily. And one of the judgments that we have to make as clinicians is how much, how high a dose of the treatment do we give? So a higher dose will usually give a better effect on the target symptom like the hallucinations, uh, but it does bring the risk of more side effects. So that's a discussion I have with patients and their family, you know, how much do we want to try to get rid of the hallucinations completely? Because although a lot of people like Mrs. G are very distressed by them, not everyone is. So it, it may be that increasing the dose would be sufficient to help further in the hallucinations of uh, whoever was asking the question or the family member of that person. Yes, thank you. I guess it's trial, trial and error sometimes with, with what you've got to offer. Um, I've got another question about medications. Um, so Katie is asking, would psychosis medication such as olanzapine, I hope I've said that right, help to reduce hallucinations caused by dementia with Lewy body? So is, is that something that you've been able to prescribe or is it one of, yeah, one of the range of things that you can offer? So as a rule, uh, we avoid olanzapine or any similar type of antipsychotic drug in people with DLB uh, because the way they work is they impair dopamine, uh, they block the effect of dopamine and it's the effect of dopamine that causes Parkinson's. So if you give an antipsychotic you'll make the Parkinson's worse in somebody like Mrs G. Um, so we avoid them if we possibly can. And I've almost never given such a drug to somebody with DLB. I don't want to say never, because I probably might have tried in desperation to help people at some point, but generally we avoid them. And on that kind of line of treatment, so as you said, there are different things that you can try in different doses, um, but can you say anything about maybe what's on the horizon for potential new treatments? What research might be happening to develop new treatments? I guess Daniel or Alan could probably take that question. Um, so with, I mean, so 
with new, so specifically with regard to new treatments and you know that are coming through or yes i think so yeah, yeah. Um, any possible treatments that yeah, might so look promising th there are some that i'm particularly interested in i don't think they they necessarily treat symptoms in, in the way that, that we have been discussing but there are some that i think may well modify the the disease process itself um, so there's some, I'm not really sure, I'll sort of defer to Alan on whether it's, it's right or proper for me to start listing these things, but... Um, it's difficult uh, to be technical, isn't it, about chemical names and things? Yeah, and so, uh, certainly there, there, there are some drugs that, that, that have an effect that, that wasn't anticipated, for example. So there are some drugs that are already available that, that quite fortuitously actually seem to reduce alpha-synuclein accumulating in the brain. Uh, some of these are, are cough medicines. One of them is an asthma drug. And I, I actually think that these are a really exciting possibility because there, there is a clear reason why they would work. They reduce this protein um, which accumulates in the brain, but also they're already licensed for use in humans and that we know that they're safe to give to elderly people. So the idea of repurposing these drugs and giving them to people, I think, has relatively little risk attached compared to most drugs trials but has the potential to be really effective. And I think of everything that's going on at the minute, these definitely excite me the most because they won't just treat a symptom. If, if they work the way we think they will, they may actually reduce or slow down the disease process quite substantially. Just to add, uh, not a new drug, which people will know from being used in Alzheimer's disease. At the moment, it's not clear whether it helps people with DLB. Um, so, there's, we've now had funding for a major trial across the country to try to answer the question whether memantine helps people with DLB and also Parkinson's disease dementia, which my colleague John Paul Taylor here is running. So we hope we will have an answer to that important question, because again, as Dan says, if you can use drugs that are already out there and we know a safe role to people, that's, that's really great. Uh, Ultimately, we want something that might be more powerful in dealing with a disease, and that will follow work that people like Dan are doing. But you know, we 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 have the option for new treatments. Wonderful. Uh, I'm just going to say we've got so many questions that I know at this point we're not going to answer them all. So I'm going to try and pick a few key ones and ones that have come up a few times. Um, and so, still on the the topic of drugs. Um, you, I think you've probably already mentioned this, but uh, things like denezepil were originally licensed for Alzheimer's, but they've shown effect in, um, in dementia with Lewy bodies. And people are asking about rivastigmine, which I think is in the same class as denezepil, and also about um, chemicals derived from daffodils, which I believe is galantamine, was originally identified in daffodils. So I, I, I think the, the question is, uh, these are similar things that are they also things you use as well as denezepil and try different ones depending on the person you're treating? So, yeah, so the galantamine, there hasn't really been much work done in, our, in dementia with lubidies and lubid diseases. And so that tends not to be used much, although it is in Alzheimer's disease. Um, Rivastigmine, there were some important trials done in Parkinson's disease dementia, which showed it was very helpful. And because of that reason, it is widely used in people with DLB. Um, I personally used an episode because we did a, a smaller trial and I'm more familiar with it with Alzheimer's. And as you say, the drugs are the same chemical class and work in very much the same way. And, it, and denepazil is, is better tolerated, doesn't cause many side effects as rivastigmine. Uh, rivastigmine has the advantage often, for some people at least, that it is available now as a patch. So you don't, if you can't take tablets by mouth, fibrostigmine can be a helpful option then. Wonderful, yes. Yeah, so it's a trial and error for the, the right drug for that right person. Um, just having a look at some other questions we have come through. Tracy's asking, what age generally do symptoms of dementia with Lewy bodies tend to appear? Very similar range to Alzheimer's disease. So in older people, I don't want to specify what old means, but similar range to Alzheimer's disease. So we, I think we typically say over the age of 65 is the kind of normal age range at which, but increasingly as people enter the later decades of 80s, 90s, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Um, let me pick another question that I think 
Uh, oh, this is one, maybe one for you, Daniel. So you are talking about Lewy bodies, which consist of this protein alpha synuclein. And Luciana is asking, if we know that alpha synuclein can develop years before a clinical diagnosis, is there any way that we could maybe prevent its progression into Lewy body dementia? I mean, I think that's an excellent question. And that's, I think, personally, is exactly what we should be aiming to do. But I think the question hinted at uh, what I think is a really key issue with this which is identifying people before they develop clinical symptoms. And this actually feeds quite nicely into the sort of one of the major strands of ARUK's research, which is in is actually diagnosing dementia, which remains a tremendous challenge. So the symptoms a person with dementia has really reflect only the areas of the brain damaged. Um, so therefore, quite a considerable amount of the brain needs to be damaged in some way before the person will be presenting with enough symptoms to be detected uh, in the clinic, and that's that's not a that's not a criticism of, of, of you know Alan and his colleagues. It's just simply the, the way it is. Um, so therefore, we need to be striving, I think, to be able to identify people before they ever have symptoms. Because I don't personally think it's likely that um, within certainly my research career, I don't want to sound sort of uh, sort of pessimistic, but I don't think it's likely we'll create a drug anytime soon that will reverse all of the symptoms of dementia and restore a person to normal functioning. Um, we'll obviously try, but I don't think it's as likely as maybe something that will slow down or stop the progression of the disease. And implicit in that is identifying the disease at an early enough stage that the person can live a relatively normal life and die of natural causes rather than succumbing to dementia. And we have the added advantage here that people with dementia tend to be quite old anyway. So therefore, if we were to buy an additional five or 10 years to stave off dementia, then that would have an astronomical impact, you know, not just on the lives of the people affected by dementia, but also economically speaking, you know, in terms of both for families and for the National Health Service. So I think that's absolutely something that we should be aiming to do, identify early and treat as soon as possible. Wonderful. I think that, that's a really good thing to end on um, as we're approaching three o'clock now. So I just want to thank both Daniel and Alan for coming along for excellent talks and ask, answering everyone's questions. It's been fantastic to have you. OK, thank you, Kate. Thank you. Bye bye. bye. Right, so if everyone can just stick with me just for a couple of minutes longer, just want to wrap up and also find out how it's gone for you. So we've got a couple of poll questions we'd love you to answer to give us some insight into how you found today. So just popped up now. So it's, would you recommend these events to your family and friends? Um, do you feel you've learned something new today? I, I certainly have. I hope you have too. And uh, would you plan on, on attending future events in the series? So I'll just pause briefly and allow you to answer those. Okay, if we can get those back up, get the res results back up on screen. It's always nerve wracking this bit. I'm sitting here hoping that you've, you've all enjoyed and learned something um, and that the results will show that. Okay, then um, you would recommend them. That's wonderful. And you feel you've learned something and many, many people saying they'll come along again. So really, thank you so much for that feedback. It's really useful for us to have as we continue to plan more events in this series. So the next event in the series is on the 26th of May at 11 a.m. And it features researchers from our Bristol and Bath network who will talk about protein folding. Now, this may seem like a very specific thing to focus on, but as you may have heard from uh, Daniel, it's actually a really important aspect of biology to understand how these proteins are going wrong. And actually folding seems to be a really important aspect of this. So do come along um, in a few weeks time to hear more about that. And you can find out more about that event and sign up on our website to join us then. Um, I know we had lots of questions both ahead of the event and live that we weren't able to answer today and you might need more personalised information or guidance on where to turn. So our Dementia Research info line is there to help you. They can answer questions and signpost to other sources of information and support. So do get in touch with them as they'll be very happy to help. The details on screen and we've also posted those in the chat as well. So 
with one minute to go, I just want to say a huge thank you for coming along today. It's been wonderful to have you. I hope you found it really interesting and took away some useful information and hope to have you join us again for another event soon. Thank you very much and goodbye.